be here and um, really excited to be able to speak to you about the work that I've been doing. Um, do I need the mic? I probably do need the microphone, yeah. Okay. What? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. So, does the future of work mean less work? The movement for a four day week. Um, I just, I thought I'd start with a few um, points about the debate on the future of work. Um, and I know Aaron's paper and others uh, have already been talking about this, Lucas's uh, talk. Um, so this debate, a lot of it has taken place uh, among economists or sort of engineers and economists. Um, in, uh, they actually put the paper up earlier, but it was published 2017. Fry and Osborne had this sort of famous paper in which they predicted that about 40% of total US employment is at risk from computerization. And of course, the economists just jumped all over them, um, everybody beating them up. And um, first round uh, was very critical of the labor displacement slash unemployment hypothesis from, from the economics profession. So I, um, I had occasion to be on a panel with an economist named Robert Siemens from NYU Stern, and he very kindly shared a couple of slides with me that he had shown. So here's the first. Uh, what's the predicted effect of total factor productivity as a result of all this automation on aggregate employment? And we analyzed this and take away, we should not be afraid of technologies that increase productivity. Um, yeah, there's a little direct effect, but then you get this big positive upstream effect, a little bit of a negative downstream effect. Net effect, very positive. Growth, a lot more employment. Everybody relax. We've been through this before. Everything's going to be okay. Um, however, he you wrote know that, that this slide is from 2018, so now he's looking at chat GPT. But professors beware, and I should have, um, I forgot to uh, highlight number six. Um, so these are his analyses, I just thought I'd cover this one in for fun. Uh, these are his analyses of the occupations which are most exposed to AI, language modeling and image generation. So on the language model side, this is the you know, AI stuff. Um, okay, English professors, I can probably don't have any of them here. History, number six, philosophy. But as someone who sits in the sociology department, I was particularly unhappy to see this because we didn't show up just one time on this chart, but two. Okay, so we are all going to be automated away. But what's interesting to me is that there actually has been more recently a considerable evolution in economist thinking, and it's, I think, getting a lot more sophisticated and, I think, sort of interesting. So the first um, really great work by Daron Asimoglu and Pascual Restrepo on robots, a very, very sophisticated kind of data here looking at what uh, robotization has done in US manufacturing, um, the highlighted part, into the, uh, we estimate wage and robust, uh, large and robust negative impacts of robots on employment and wages. So, you know, very, very prominent economists coming out with quite a contrarian paper a couple of years ago. And uh, even maybe more interesting to me is David Autor recently saying, traditional economic optimism about the beneficent effects of technology for productivity and welfare has eroded as our understanding has advanced. So actually, the, the uh, field is getting a lot more interesting with not just, okay, forget it, don't worry about it, everything's gonna be fine. But there's also the question of who will benefit from emerging technologies, workers or owners of capital, and in some sense, what I want to present here today is an argument about um, way, a way that workers can really benefit through work time reduction associated with um, technological change. So on the one hand, you also have new work by uh, Asimoglu and Johnson 
very, very sort of warn, warning us very strongly about AI and uh, the current path of AI is neither good for the economy nor for democracy, and these two problems unfortunately reinforce each other. So, so a much stronger kind of warning, um, not, this is not just a problem of unemployment or wages for workers, but it's a bigger social problem. And um, I put Bernie Sanders here, he's been talking about AI and uh, the work week and lowering the work week because he is about to, I hope soon, any, I'm not sure exactly when, but soon going to introduce a bill into Congress to reduce the standard work week to 32 hours. And his concerns about AI are one of the big things that's motivating him and, and concern precisely because of this question, are workers going to be able to benefit at all from this? So, um, I do want to add two points to this debate, which are um, almost always missing in the way economists think about past experience and also in the way they think about what might happen going forward. Um, and this, this relates, uh, you know, in part to Julie's work and obviously to many others in the room. Two things are missing from the debate. The first is to remember that if we think about the period from the Industrial Revolution to the present, one of the big reasons that all of that labor-saving technical change did not lead to mass unemployment is because we had such rapidly growing economies. And I'm not sure how easy it is for you to see these, but the top one is the what what uh, they're called the Western offshoot economies. Uh, I could also call them the settler colonial economies, but they're basically Anglophone countries outside of the UK. Um, the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, very, very rapidly growing. The next blue line is Western Europe. And so you see, um, really, from the late 19th century um, until the present, you know, quite rapid growth, which has always been the sort of underlying condition for labor-saving technical change not leading to mass unemployment or you know, other bad outcomes. And of course, the second one, which also accompanied that growth, is that very, very pronounced decline in working hours from 1870 to 1970. And so if you have a country like the United States, which has really significant barriers to work time reduction, then the introduction of rapid uh, labor-saving technical, uh, labor-saving technology um, is much more likely to yield unemployment uh, than in a world in which you can actually reduce your hours, as for example, maybe we could say Western Europe. All right. That's just some background. We can come back to that, to those questions. Um, but for me, uh, oh yeah, actually, I think I had one. Have those conditions changed? So the, the economists' world in which they still assume rapid growth and the possibilities of work time, uh, 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 working hours reductions. I think the first thing I would say is, um, I think they have changed for the mature economies, for the wealthy economies, and the idea that we're going to be able to replicate the growth uh, experience of the late 19th and 20th century, I think, is uh, probably wrong. Of course, we are in historically uncharted territory, but the, the latest GDP uh, numbers in the United States notwithstanding, um, I think there's a decent argument to be made that we're going to be looking at much slower uh, GDP growth. And this is, this, is, um, um, this is just a graph of the sort of the gap between potential output and actual output showing much lower growth for the US, the Euro area, Japan, and the UK um, in the last, uh, from 2000 to uh, 2015. And of course, if you look at the U, the US is a little bit of an outlier here, but if you look at the EU, a downward trend in growth, and of course, Japan, which is just a fascinating case, which basically hasn't grown in, uh, you know, in decades at this point. So that's, that is a, those are current dollars, not even um, uh, 
uh, deflated dollars. So um, secular stagnation is, uh, is, I think, a real possibility. Um, and then, of course, we can also ask the question, is continued growth consistent with climate targets? So all the philosophers in the room, is it, is it a morally um, OK thing to do for rich countries to keep trying to grow in a world where they have already um, exceeded, in terms of their legacy emissions, far beyond their fair share and are currently continuing to do so? Um, and you know, I have argued for a long period of time uh, that the answer to that question is no, that we shouldn't be growing. Um, but uh, we can also see, finally, the IPCC is putting in uh, scenarios uh, which are low energy demand scenarios, which means low GDP growth scenarios. And those are those bottom low emission scenarios, which are the ones that we absolutely need to get ourselves onto. OK, so the second point I made was that work time reduction accompanied technical change. And this is just a, a, a smaller set of countries, but France, Germany, Japan, Netherlands, UK, and US. Um, and, you know, the Japanese sort of leveled out for a while, but you know, they're, they're not that far off from the US now. They've had big work time reductions uh, since 1973. So we, um, just a, a word or two about work time patterns since 1973. So this is 73 to 2019. This is productivity per hour. Of course, going up um, in, in virtually all countries. And this is what's happened to hours worked uh, for you know, a reasonable set of countries um, since uh, 1973. And what, of course, you can see some of these countries which have done uh, a lot to reduce their working hours. The three at the bottom, Netherlands, Germany, and France, I think well known. Um, and uh, uh, what I want to call your attention to is the US, I don't have my pointer with my laser pointer, sorry. The US case, which is that little dotted line in the middle, um, where we've seen virtually no work time reduction since 1973. Um, and so if you are a country that has, for whatever reasons, and we can talk about why it's hard to reduce work time in the US as in comparison to, say, Germany, France, Netherlands, Sweden, uh, Spain, uh, even Japan at this point, um, if you are a country that has those barriers, um, the introduction of these kinds of technologies is going to be more perilous from the point of view of employment and uh, who benefits and who pays the price. You know what, I'm going to skip over this, just basically showing how little the US and, and um, the UK also have done in terms of how much of their productivity growth over this period they have taken in the form of shorter hours. Uh, so in the US, it's been under 80%. Um, Germany, Netherlands, Italy, uh, France, etc. they're all in the over 25%, 33%, 34%, uh, etc. Okay, so um, on to the four day week. So with that as background, um, basically the point I want to make is that one of the things that you really need to do if you want to protect against the employment displacing dimensions of digital technologies and AI is make sure that you can actually reduce working hours in your country. Um, the four day week and work time reduction more generally is understood by many people, if I think correctly, to be what we would call a multi-dividend reform. It brings well-being, um, it brings economic benefits, social benefits, and climate benefits. And I'm going to talk about some of those today. So um, as Alex said, I have been studying companies that are instituting four-day weeks for their employees. We have gotten a tremendous amount of publicity about uh, it. So these are just some of the um, some of the stories that have been written about this work. 
Um, and the tremendous successes that these companies are having as they reduce working hours. I think my favorite is the one that Benjamin Applebaum wrote recently um, as a, sort of queued up by a, a rather unexpected, but I think very, very important uh, new entrant into this conversation, and that's the UAW, who put a 32-hour week on the bargaining table Seemingly out of nowhere, um, part, of, part of the reason I say that is uh, because this, uh, unions have played a very minor role in the four-day week movement, the current four-day week movement um, until now. And in the United States, this is the first, uh, this was the first real step for unions to, to sort of jump into the ring and uh, be heard on this. And, uh, the AFL-CIO also has now endorsed a 32-hour week. So Applebaum gives a very full-throated um, defense of the 32-hour week, um, which I was a little bit surprised about, because he's an economic columnist, uh, no having an eye that it's just a 100% positive column um, about a month ago. So, um, uh, I think the, so this is where we are, and I think that um, to uh, contextualize it, I want to take us back to uh, the struggle for a five-day week, just to see what's happening here and how it might be similar or not to the movement for a five-day week. Uh, and then I'll get on to uh, show you the, the data and the findings that we've had from all this research we've done. So, how do we get to the five-day week? The, I think the sort of conventional wisdom about the five-day week is that the unions brought it to us. And there's that you know, famous bumper sticker, the union movement, the people who brought you the weekend. And here it is, not a bumper sticker, but this is an older version of that. Um, and there is a certain amount of truth in that, but if we look at the origins of this movement, it turns out the unions came a bit late to the, to the party, um, not unlike what is happening today. So the first uh, companies and the first movements for a five-day week in the United States were Sabbatarian, and it was Jewish businessmen who wanted to get uh, Saturdays off. And in fact, one of them uh, famously, uh, I think died recently, the family, Alan Florstein from Malden Mills, which got famous for other reasons here in New England because they were, uh, the factory burned down and instead of, it's a textile company, instead of locating overseas, they rebuilt their New England factory. But his ancestor was the first uh, company, textiles, to go to the, the uh, five-day week. And textiles were uh, the most important industry in the very, very beginning, because of course there were a lot of Jewish business owners in textiles. And then it spread to other businesses. So this is a 1920 article uh, from a magazine called Factory, the magazine of management, why it paid us to adopt the five-day week. Um, and it's, um, it's about how uh, these companies which are starting to do this are getting better uh, production. Uh, so here, increased production resulted in 14% less time, so they're finding a more efficient, more productive workforce when they go from six to five. And then, you know, if it's not the, if you ask, how do we get the five-day week? If people don't say the labor movement, they will say Henry Ford. Henry Ford was also a bit late to the party. By 1920, there were already, you know, quite a few businesses doing this, not a mass movement by any means. He was the first major, really big employer to institute a five-day week in 1926, but he was not uh, at the forefront of this. Um, and then, of course, in 1938, we get the Fair Labor Standards Act, which 
uh, installs a 40 hour week as the statutory work week. It does not limit hours above 40. It just says that employers will have to pay time and a half for so-called non-exempt employees, so at that time, hourly workers. Um, just one other uh, point to make on the Fair Labor Standards Act and uh, how we ended up in that, uh, going in that direction. There was earlier a bill which passed Congress. Uh, it was uh, the Black Connery Bill. It was for a 30-hour week, and that was not a, it was just to set the work week at 30 hours in the United States, the purpose of which was to increase employment. And it passed the Senate, and Roosevelt said he was going to sign it, and then there was so much business opposition to it that he changed his mind and went in the direction of the Fair Labor Standards Act. So that's that's um, not except that's on the you know those would have been five uh, six hour days with the Black Connery. So what I am seeing today is actually very similar to the way things played out in the 1920s and 30s. From the following perspective, I am seeing an employer-led movement early on with unions coming in a couple of years after this work has started. Um, interesting, the AFL or the uh, the AFL originally was very antagonistic to the five day, uh, the five day week. Eventually they came around. Um, we haven't seen that necessarily uh, today, but we haven't seen really much action coming from trade unions yet. That's just starting to change in the last couple of months. So, as I said, there's a kind of similar process occurring now, starting with employers who are beginning to take decisions in their companies to reduce working hours, this time from five to four. And we can ask the question, why? And this is a US data. Um, the, the, the one on the left, the, the uh, excuse me, daily negative emotions, the top two, uh, top two series are stress and worry. And you can see uh, really high levels of stress and worry among, this is US and Canada. We are the highest in the world on this, but there, other countries are not far behind. But the, the question is a really strong question. It says, did you experience the following feelings a lot of the day yesterday? And 44% of the workforce is saying yes. A lot, not just a fleeting, a fleeting experience of stress, but a lot of the day. 44% on stress, 40% on worry. The green uh, uh, figure is uh, Gallup's own, uh, these are both from Gallup. It's their proprietary employee engagement measure. And what you see is a decline there with the pandemic and a rise in what they call actively disengaged. So these are people who are kind of hostile, uh, back to Pascal, people are kind of hostile to their, to their work. Um, of course, you've heard about the great resignation, the historic levels of quits that uh, beset the US economy uh, in the pandemic. The, the sort of popular version of this being all those TikTok videos, take this job and shove it. And there was just another big flare up on TikTok, uh, TikTok in the last couple of days about the, the woman who has a nine to five job, a young woman that talked about how it's just too much and she doesn't have time to do this, go to the gym or this or that by the time she gets home and she cooks dinner and she's exhausted and she's got to uh, get into bed and you know wake up and go to work. And then of course, you know, people who are making fun of her, criticizing her because she's a relatively privileged person, but that she has a job, and it's a white collar job. And so high levels of quits. I love this one. This is Google searches for burnout from work, and you see it just absolutely soars during the pandemic, um, those last couple of years. And then um, this last one is total unfilled job vacancies, uh, again, US data. But employers are sitting with large numbers of positions that they cannot fill. So people are stressed out, worried, 
They're feeling burned out. A growing number are disengaged. They are leaving their jobs. The companies can't get anybody to take their places. And that whole set of circumstances which is happening in the US labor market, I would argue, is really important for why this movement has begun. Because many employers are doing this because they see it as a solution to the problems that this set of graphs and uh, charts have just outlined. So, uh, on to our trials. The trials began, uh, as I say, employer-driven beginning in um, sometime in either 2017 or 2018, a man named Andrew Barnes, uh, he's a British-born British entrepreneur who relocated to New Zealand, read an article in a business magazine, and I'm sorry I don't remember the magazine, I've got to ask him what it was, but the article said, oh, the average person in today's workplace only works two to three hours a day. And of course, that's a ridiculous claim. There's no way that's true. But, and I don't know if Andrew actually believed it, but he tells his origin story, he makes it seem like he believed it, but no matter what he thought as a result of reading this article was, well, if there's really so much wasted time in the workplace, maybe I could offer my workers, if they just, you know, do a little bit more work, I can give them one day off. So if they're willing to do as much work in four days as they're currently doing in five, I'm going to give them this gift of the fifth day off. And he developed what he calls the 180-100 model. 100% of the pay for 80% of the time, but you have to do 100% of the work. And he actually had his workers sign a contract, saying, I'll do, I'll do all my work in four days. It was a tremendous success at his business, and he went all over the world you know, uh, talking about it and so forth. And he and his wife, Charlotte, formed an organization called Four Day Week Global to advocate for the four day week. And they began recruiting companies in 2021 to start a trial. The first trial was in Ireland for various reasons. And actually, one of the interesting little footnotes on this is that the person who was the key organizer for that trial actually worked for a union, the largest public sector union in, in Ireland. It's called Forza. And uh, they wanted to do this. They wanted to put their people onto a four-day week because they also didn't have like, all that high productivity, is my understanding of public service workers in Ireland. And so they thought it could work for them, but politically they felt they had to get the private sector doing it first, and then they could come in. So they lent Joe to this organization to try and get a trial going. And I was asked to be the lead researcher for these trials uh, as a result of my earlier work on work time and um, agreed to do that. And we started the first trial, which was an Irish trial plus a few other companies, uh, a, a big global software company, big in our, in our world of these trials, about 400 people. Um, and the way the program worked is they would get, uh, it's a six month trial. Um, and but there would be two months of coaching and one four-day week at Andrew Barnes had called work reorganization. So the point is that if you're gonna that if you're an organization that's gonna go to this, you have to figure out how to actually keep your output at hundred percent. And so there, there are various ways that companies do this, but they address the sources of wasted time and inefficient practices in their companies. And I can talk more about that. To join a trial, all you had to do was agree to maintain uh, pay 100% and enact a meaningful reduction in work hours. So we did not specify that everybody had to go down to 32. We actually had one of the early companies uh, had a 55 hour work week for their, it's a restaurant chain, and so restaurant chefs and managers work long hours. So they brought them down about 10 hours, six, eight, eight to 10 hours a week. Um, so just something meaningful. If you went down to uh, 35 or 34, that would be okay 
to. Uh, this is the team. Uh, Alec mentioned my colleague, Gwen Fawn, and these are uh, two of our PhD students who are working on the team with us. And we also now have collaborators in a number of the countries that we've uh, been working in. So the biggest group is in the UK, Cambridge, um, but we have a, another group uh, in Minnesota and uh, elsewhere. So these are the trials that we have, have run. That first one, as I said, Ireland uh, and some US, and then a US and Canada trial, the UK trial, which is the biggest trial uh, by far. Uh, there's just a lot of interest in this in the UK. We have 2,500 participants at baseline. There were actually close to 70 companies that did it, um, 57 in our research. Then an Australia-New Zealand trial, another US-Canada, a mixed Europe-North American trial uh, last February, a South African trial, we have the US-Canadian trial, which technically started two days ago. Um, there's another trial uh, in South Africa, there's a Pan-African trial, there's a German trial, which is, is now recruiting, there's a Brazilian trial, um, I think we're going to work with the Danish, and then there are some government-sponsored trials that I'll mention. But uh, we have uh, about 7,500, and if you add in the new trials, we're probably getting close to 10,000 participants. Um, we have 215 companies at the moment in our database. We're also collecting companies who are doing this from not as part of these trials, but just you know, consultants are bringing us companies, and there are other groups that are organizing them. So we are collecting as much data as we can. This doesn't include the very last uh, uh, to, I think it has up, up through South Africa. Um, it is very white collar. So you can see here, professional services marketing are about half of these companies. So there are a lot of small PR agencies, advertising agencies, other um, architects, graphic designers, white collar professionals, um, of course IT, uh, well, no, this is not primarily software companies, but they're in there. Um, increasingly, we're hearing from social service agencies. I got a call not too long ago from someone in a New England social service agency that want to join a trial, and she says they have a 100% turnover in one of their divisions. I mean, the, just the levels of attrition are, are out of control. Um, but we also do have construction firms and manufacturing and restaurants and healthcare, the kinds of places that people think it's not possible to do this in. Um, partly as an artifact of the trials, there are a lot of small companies. So you can see here that almost a quarter have under 10. And what I say as an artifact of the trials, it's because if you are a big company, you do not need to join a trial being run by a little NGO. You do not need me to do your research. You have money for consultants, you can do your own research, and so forth. So we don't have any mega, mega sized companies. The biggest size companies that we have had in the trial are about a thousand. Um, but I'm also hearing increasingly from big companies that are thinking, well, maybe we'll do this with a subset. So I heard from Standard & Poor's, 35,000 employees. We have a healthcare. Uh, company in New Jersey that has 35,000 employees that's doing it with a couple of divisions. So the big ones will go more cautiously and they'll do, they'll just pile with a few divisions before they move. Um, employee demographics, college or above are three quarters, but we do have a quarter of the sample who have not, uh, do not have college degrees. And another thing, this is not just a Gen Z uh, phenomenon. Um, we, our age distribution is not that different from the age distribution in the countries where we are. Um, we do tend uh, a little bit to be uh, more, uh, more women. Uh, you can see 60 to 38% to male and about 25% non-white. Um, I better move a little faster. Huh? Okay, so companies have had really positive experiences with the trial. At the end, we asked them to rate it. The overall rating of these companies is 8.5, and we asked them to rate productivity and performance 7.5 and 7.5. So quite positive ratings. Um, unfortunately, 
it's a lot of these companies don't have productivity metrics for their employees, so I can't tell you what exactly happened to productivity. Um, I can just tell you what they say, you know, how they rate it. Um, we can get into that. That's a complicated thing. Um, if partly it's because there are a lot of white collar workers, partly it's because of the diversity of the firms and the smallness of a lot of them. But I suppose the proof is in the pudding. How many people are reverting back to five days after the trial? And there, uh, basically there are 10 out of the 195 who've completed six months or more. 10 have reverted. We have four who have paused and five are just five who sort of they haven't decided yet, but you know, based on the others, that they're they'll probably go. There are a few we don't have information from, but that six percent takes them takes them out. So it's very, very successful in terms of people continuing. A few of them are tweaking, um, but but uh, basically continuing. Okay, so what are the employee results? Um, the first point is that work time doesn't typically fall all the way to 32 hours, or it's not an eight hour decline at the beginning. We, have, we do have 12 month data now, which I, I don't have, I'm not showing today, but the work time reduction increases after, after six months. So it takes them, some of them, some time to get into it, to figure out how can I actually reorganize things so that I can get everything done. Um, we ask a lot of questions about people's own sense of the pace of work, well, of, of their own competency. So there's a work smart scale, which goes up. The big increase we're seeing is in this variable called current workability, which is down there near the bottom. Um, and that is where we ask people beginning and end, and that's our basic methodology. It's a baseline and then an endpoint survey. So it's a within subjects survey. Uh, how would you rate your current workability compared to your lifetime best? This goes up by almost a point. And one of the things we find, I'm not going to show you the models, but in the models of well-being, what is it that's driving the increase in well-being? Well, the first answer to that is the work time reduction. And the bigger the work time reduction, the bigger the well-being impact. And then what is it about the work time reduction that's driving the well-being impact? And there are two parts to that. One part is what's happening in the workplace, and that's that current workability and work smart. People feel more competent, efficacious, uh, on top of their work, and that contributes to their well-being. And then the other is sort of behavioral things, which I'll say in a minute. Most of these others are retrospective. We ask at the end what happened to your pace of work. People say it went up, but if you ask about work intensity before and after, it actually doesn't rise. I think there's some increase, but not by much. It's i.e., this is not primarily a speed up. It, work reorganization does work. They are actually changing people's conditions of work in ways that allow them to get their work done in a shorter period of time. Okay, we have lots and lots of well-being variables. Stress, burnout, job satisfaction, physical health, mental health, anxiety, positive emotions, negative emotions, work family balance, blood life balance, family work problem, work with family problem, life satisfaction. All of these improve, and in some cases by a tremendous amount. Almost 70% of the people in our trials experience a reduction in burnout, 68% on average, um, and their time satisfaction is off the charts. You know, to talk about people's time, you know, work and leisure time. Um, so really, really consistent, very, very large increases. And the other thing is that these are consistent in three ways across time, because we now have two years worth, almost two years worth of trials, across countries, and across virtually every subgroup in this sample, which is one of the things that really surprised us. We thought, well, it's going to be better for this group, for that group. No, the, the differences in well-being by subgroups, whether we're talking race, gender, age, uh, parental status, etc., are not significant. Uh, the the well-being impacts are really pretty general. Um, that second thing that I said, in addition to workability, that's driving the well-being, is 
Fatigue, sleep, and exercise. People are exercising more, their sleep problems decline, they are sleeping more, and they are much less tired. And that's really key. We have a colleague that we collaborate with in the UK who's doing MRIs uh, on people who go to four day work weeks and looking at that uh, she's particularly interested in the sleep. Um, what are people doing? They are, um, uh, you know what, I'm going to skip this because I'm going to show you what they're doing on their days off. So economists like to talk about willingness to pay. How much is the four day week worth to people? So we ask that 97% prefer it. We ask them if you uh, we're thinking about your next job, and it was a five-day-a-week job. What kind of salary requirements would you have? 14% say no amount of money would get them back to a five-day week. 9% say a 50% increase. Uh, a third are wanting between 26 and 50% a really big increase. And then 39% uh, want between 10 and 25%. What are they doing on their day off? And this is really relevant to, to our last session, Julie's talk. Leisure activities is the biggest thing that people are doing. They are basically into hobbies. So they're really increasing their hobbies. Um, second thing is household work and caring, prefacing Nancy's talk tomorrow. And then the third, again, back to Julie, personal maintenance. So that's like um, getting your hair cut, personal grooming, uh, doing things. So they're mostly doing that, and they're not jetting off for uh, three-day weekends, which is something we were worried about for the climate dimensions. Um, government interest in the four-day week is expanding. Spain, Portugal, Scotland, uh, and Belgium are all doing trials, and uh, the Portuguese, uh, and hopefully the Belgians are using our instruments, so we'll be able to incorporate that data. Um, I'm on the research team for the Scottish trial. The UAE reduced its, it went first to 4.5 for public sector workers and down to 4 for some workers. The House has legislation, as I said, I'm hoping the Senate will have it fairly soon, uh, reducing the work week in the U.S. Various states have legislation. And here in Massachusetts, on November 14th, we have two bills that are having a hearing. One is by a DSA member, Erica Oiterhoven, who's replicating the House bill to go graduated reduction to 32 as the standard work week. And then Josh Cutler, who's the chair of the House Committee on Labor and Workforce Development, is uh, putting in a bill to have a two-year trial similar to what we have done with tax breaks for companies who sign up. Um, we are also looking at uh, carbon outcomes. We are seeing reductions in commuting even as more people are going back into the office. So a little bit of a reduction in commuting, reduction in prevalence of using a car to commute, reduction in amount of time spent commuting. 42% of people say they're doing more environmentally friendly activities like recycling, walking and cycling rather than driving. Not a, we're not seeing a travel rebound, which we were worried about. And then we did start asking more recently about their carbon footprint, um, self-rated compared to others in your country. Um, it looks like it went down a little, but it's not significant. Um, and this, this is numbers of people in each of these categories, so the decrease is barely bigger than the increase. Why this movement is likely to spread, it's a really potent change for improving well-being uh, because of the economic outcomes that have been so good and the climate benefits. Obviously, I think the growth of AI makes shorter hours both possible and necessary. And this is something that companies are talking to us about, the ways in which AI is making it possible for them to reduce working hours. And uh, I think we're going to see persistent labor shortage, at least for a while. Uh, at least in the U.S. Um, I'm going to skip over the gig labor stuff and stop there and uh, look forward to hopefully have a few moments for questions. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so we have about 15 minutes or so for Q&A. Um, you know, I want to be mindful of your free time. It's, it's on our minds. Thank you. I learned a lot um, by learning about this and I'm very interested in these things. Um, I have a question about like, the um, So in absence of a 
choice to remain, let's say, a decision that hurts me. And thinking like parallel with, for example, you know, the provision of paying parental in the United States, you observe that firms that are very productive pay high wages and offer these benefits, and so this increases the monthly inequality in workers who have both high wages and benefits and workers who have low wages in countries. I wonder if you think whether something similar can happen with the four world um, for weekdays, sorry, if uh, uh, legislation is not in the country. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if we don't get legislation, it will be like many other benefits that are equally uh, distributed. And I think the, uh, you know, we have far fewer hourly workers in our sample than we do when we have hourly workers. But, it, you know, it is a more privileged group of employees than the, the average, uh, pretty much everywhere. So this is why the government role is so key and, um, you know, why I'm devoting as much time as I can to trying to push it. Um, and uh, this is also why, I, I mean, although I support the reduction of the standard work week to 32, I think, you know, Workers never go, full time workers never gone a 40 hour week in the US until very, you know, their hours have always been above 40. So I don't, I mean, it, it's a wage increase, which is good because low wage workers need a wage increase, but I, it doesn't guarantee people that time. So um, absolutely, government role is necessary. I like these trials because they give the legislators some evidence that they can use to then put legislation in. And the other thing about the trials is that where you've got the government running them rather than just this random NGO, um, they can do more to get the kind of mix of workers into the trial, mix of companies' workers into the trials uh, to show uh, that it's not just uh, you know software developers who can benefit by this, for sure. Thanks so much. I'm wondering um, how much of the present kind of excitement and support do you think is Can you speak more loudly? Sorry. How much of the present excitement and support around the idea is um, you think related to the pandemic and the historically tight labor market, particularly around the US? And the second question around that is the employment data recently suggests that um, even though um, unemployment is really low. More and more people at the lower end of the job market are taking up two jobs. So one worry would be that when the 40 hour week gets introduced to the low end of the labor market, if it doesn't come with um, constant take home pay, there's a redu proportional or even partially proportional reduction in pay for the low end workers, uh, the two job kind of situation will become normal for the low end workers. Yeah. So the first one, the pandemic was absolutely central in a couple of ways. One is, as I was trying to indicate with all those dynamics of what's going on with the pandemic, it's the sort of what was ha what's happening in the labor market. Also, the really high levels of stress that the pandemic created, which were not all workplace related, but you know, people bringing a lot of stress just from what was going on in their lives and the stress of a pandemic, and you know, also the stress of the climate destabilizing and so forth. Um, and employers are reacting to that. The, but the pandemic also, um, I use the word turbocharged, the turbocharged, this would have been around a little bit, it really wasn't getting anywhere. It turbocharged it because, as one of the, the first US company in our sample said, work from home taught us that we could trust our employees in terms of where they worked. And now we can trust them in terms of how much work they do. So work from home just kind of blew open possibilities in the American workforce, and not just in the US. And I think that was also a really key thing, is that it opened employers' minds to things that might be possible. A lot of these small firms, it's also the employers themselves who are really stressed out. Um, so on your second question, so everybody's getting a, a Wherever you are on the scale, you're getting a big wage increase here because you're working, uh, you know, one fewer day and your pay is not going down. We did, uh, we have looked at second job holding, and because I was really worried about that in the U.S. case, you know, based on what we know, zero increase anywhere 
we're not seeing any increase in second job holding. I think you're right that if we had a much lower wage group, we'd see more of it. Um, and, and this is why I also say four day work week plus UBI, because what a UBI could do would be to actually make it more feasible for people to get that day off, because the day off itself is really, really important. You're not gonna get the well-being effects um, if, you don't, if you don't get that day off. So that's, that's key. Um, did I miss anything? Yeah. So I think Pascal was next. Thanks, this is um, really fascinating. I know you uh, look mostly at white collar workers, but you said there was a bit of diversity in the pool. So I was wondering if you had looked and found any, I don't know, analyzed differences between different kinds of work, especially in terms of the effect on output, which seems like it would be really relevant for predicting like, which kinds of employers will resist this kind of legislation and which will be so. Okay, so we don't have any output measures. We just, we have the self reports. And we have the well-being, we have employee well-being. No, well, we've looked at like industry, we've looked by company size, we've looked by country, nothing, nothing. It's fascinating that, no, you're getting pretty similar. I mean, there are a few small things, like IT workers get a little bit more exercise in, construction workers have a little bit of a bigger increase on this one well-being measure, but nothing consistent. Um, but I think we've, we've looked at industry, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure we've put occupation into, and we're not seeing it there. So it, it's kind of mind, honestly, it's a little mind blowing to me that we're not seeing any of those differences. Julie and then Aaron. Thanks so much. Um, it's also just really exciting to think about this being a time where you can be doing big studies about, you know, at the time of the five day work week was introduced, you know, there weren't people doing MRI studies on people's sleep. <laughs> It's great to get all this data supporting the fact that it makes people's lives better. Um, I was wondering if you looked at whether or not people reduced the degree to which they outsource household tasks. You know, are they less likely to use Instacart and more likely to go grocery shopping, that kind of thing? The reason why I thought it might be of interest is that if we think some of that kind of work is potentially problematic from a social inequality point of view, in that it's often racialized or gender, um, has these other kind of class inequality dimensions to it. You know, it might be valuable if even the most, even if you are skewing toward the more privileged workers, if they then are doing more of this kind of stuff themselves rather than hiring people to do it. Yeah, we don't ask specifically about that. We do have that slide I skipped over. We do have other stuff on um, time care and for kids and housework and so forth. So they are doing more housework. I mean, we see it on that day off. Um, but, so no, I don't know about the provisioning, like the privacy provisioning. The one thing I didn't mention is we, all, we, we, we did collect data on the gender distribution of labor in heterosexual couples, and we find that it gets better, uh, more equal. Um, men are doing a little bit more housework, a little, little bit, but they, they, are, uh, they are doing significantly more child care, which is like another, that's a, consistent with findings from just going on, you know, more generally. So Aaron and then Maria and then Nir. We'll, we'll see if we can get to everything. If not, we can talk. I'll talk faster. Uh, I guess, I, I mean, I think that what's so brilliant about it to me is this idea that, I mean, at least this is kind of what I want to ask about. For the US case, it feels like there's been so little work reduction that it seems to really make possible, you know, an achievement of like, with no trade-off, right? Like we can both work less and not see a reduction in income at the same time. And, and uh, part of what I'm interested in is, I mean, first of all, it makes me think that it's something I'm interested in, I'm wondering if this comes up at all, that reorganizing work to reduce the amount of time we work and reorganizing work to increase productivity maybe aren't quite the same somehow. Though there's something about specifically the consultations that were aimed at getting people to do the same amount of work in four days. You know, it, it seems to suggest to me, or does it suggest that there were unrealized productivity gains that these companies had pursued, or was there something different about this reorganization 
that it was picking up possibilities that were being activated otherwise. And then a kind of related question is like, you know, you're, you're doing the studies across all these different countries. Some of those countries have already been on a trajectory of work time reduction, right? And so were there any differences in the ability to figure out how to achieve these goals across in countries that had a stronger history of already reducing work weeks versus like the US where that hadn't been tried? And just generally, like I'm wondering about I feel like when you were about to start the trial, I talked to you and I, like there is this big question about whether people would trade lower incomes for more time. And you know, your the way things worked out, it seems like that just doesn't come up. Like you know, the, it's like a bold and we can both have the same amount of income and work less. I wonder if the people who benefited from the four-day work week would 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 actually also go, like would they go a little further, you know? Would they take a little bit even less time for a little less pay that were further option? Yeah. Okay, so on the first one, I'm not a devotee of the 180 100 model. I want to say that. I mean there are companies that it works for, but I also talk about the 180, which is there are a lot of people in the workforce who are burning out, they're stressed, they just need a break. Give them one day, fewer, one less day of work with no reduction in pay and hiring people. And we do have companies, a few, that are doing that, or some that are doing a little bit of that. And the argument is that they're, they actually, it may work out financially for them because they're going to stabilize their workforce and reduce their training costs and their unemployment and, and so forth. So that's the first thing. It, it's a whole big question, like, is there a free lunch there? Of course, the economists are like, eh, how could this possibly be happening? And Nicholas Bloom at Stanford Business School was like, my friends here in Silicon Valley, okay, like his head of Google and Meta and whatever, um, are saying to him, I'm insulted by this, that the idea that we would have wasted time in our workforce. And, okay, that's, there is wasted time. But there are companies that you can't do it at. In 1992, I went to Motorola to try and do this, and it's like, these people have been sped up to the, there's no way there's any wasted time there. So there's a real uh, variation across the labor force, uh, across industries, across types of firms. And when, maybe the big firms are more efficient, I don't know. I, I went to TED to give a talk on this, and. I sat with Bill Gates' his son, I had dinner, he had a dinner, his chief of staff, who used to work at Apple, and he was just telling me the incredible stories about the, the huge amounts of wasted time in meetings, which is like the number one act that, that these companies are doing. So I'm not sure if this works for us right, I'll just say that. Um, your second question was? Countries across countries, like countries that Yes. So, okay, it's interesting. The Spanish did it first. They did it to reduce unemployment. They don't have a 180 100 model. They, they are subsidizing the wages. Um, and I think for the governments, they're going to have, they can't expect. And this is back to the very first question about the you know, fairness across. They can't expect that every company is going to be able to get full productivity. You don't have to. You just have to you know, make it work in some way. And have the, there are a lot of social benefits to this that the government should willingly you know, support. Especially when we talk about teaching, healthcare, these service professions where people are burning out. We're paying a lot of money to train these people. And they're leaving the fields. So absolutely, big argument there for helping the firms figure out how to do it. And the thing is that, that it, they, maybe it's a little costly at the beginning, but think about all that technology that's coming in. That can fund it as you go forward. And your last question is about the uh, income and whether the, the trade off So my view of this, so this is different than what I've advocated for many years, which is trade productivity growth for a shorter work time. This is shorter work time drives productivity growth. And both things happen. I think this is, for the US especially, it's a first step to get us out of the, the, um, the uh, whatever, the jam that we're in, that we can't get working hours down. 
and that as people start to get more free time, that we get on a trajectory, especially with the AI and technology, that we just start doing this. Um, so, yes, and the last point to your question is, the first pan-European trial we got, nobody from France, Germany, uh, Netherlands, nobody there was interested in it. Um, now they're starting to come on. Egan Mattel put a 32-hour week into its bargaining for 80,000 steel workers this fall. So we'll see what happens with that. So we have time maybe for just one more. So here, I'm sorry. Yeah. I just wanted to invite to say something about the gig work that you had to do. Oh, you know, I got into studying gig work at, uh, in 19, 2008. I was, the nine, I was writing a book, and I thought, oh, this looks great. People can get out of their long hour jobs and earn a little bit of extra money and, and de link, de link from long hours jobs. And of course, it, it turned out very differently. <laughs> um, I don't know what else. Oh, I had, a, I had something to say about it, but I don't know. I've spent like 12 years studying gig work now, and I can talk about it forever. <laughs> Okay, well we can we can continue this conversation for the folks who are going to dinner. So everyone please